This is our topic. We're talking about focus and finish and how to help student um, um, acquire these executive functioning skills to combat perfectionism and procrastination and and basically get their college application done. <laughs> so there are four of us who are presenting. Um, this is our agenda. Uh, we're going to introduce you to two case examples um, about, um, you know, to introduce you to various challenges the student face. And then Amanda and I are going to talk about like why, what is this, what are the cycles of procrastination and perfectionism? Why do these things happen um, to our children? What doesn't work and what does work and, and what we can do to help these students. And at the end, Maddie and Ian are going to tell us, um, you know, based on the two case examples that in, they introduced, uh, they're going to um, tell us how to, what they can, we can actually do to help these students. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, go ahead, Maddie. Okay, so the first case study that we have is dealing with perfectionism. And I have a person here called Emily, like me and Ian, she's a senior in high school. And like many of your children and many people that you know, she loves to challenge herself. So she takes many AP and honors level courses. Now, Emily loves to write and is really excited to create an impactful essay for college applications. And she keeps saying that she wants to write the perfect college essay, but she hasn't been able to start writing anything. Okay, does that sound an, like any of your students? <laughs> okay. So basically, one incident that one incident that happened in Emily's life was she was assigned by an English teacher to write a rough draft for her college application essay. And because Emily really loves to write and she wants to write a very creative essay, she wants to create an innovative essay topic. And as a result, she spends hours working on different ideas, trying to brainstorm new creative takes on her life. And because she really wants to write the so-called perfect essay, she continues to delete and rewrite and edit her essay, you know, deleting a lot of chunks or adding a lot of chunks because she feels like it isn't perfect yet. And she pulls what a lot of students call an all-nighter. If you don't know what that is, it's basically when you don't go to bed, you just do work instead. So she pulls an all-nighter to try and get her essay finished before her project deadline, which leads to a lot of sleep deprivation. So she's really stressed about writing her essay. And as a result, she pulls an all-nighter. Mm -hmm. Now, the next day, Emily um, is talking to her friend, Samantha, and Samantha shows Emily her essay, and Samantha's really proud of it. She thinks that it's a really good essay. She's really proud of what she wrote. But instead of praising her friend, Emily negatively compares her own essay to Samantha's essay, which causes Samantha to feel stressed. So she says things like, oh, I think you could have written this better, or like, I wouldn't have written that. She kind of, she kind of compares the essays together, and that makes Samantha feel a lot of pressure on herself as well, because the pressure that Emily put on herself to make her essay perfect is now being transferred to Samantha. Now, Emily turns in her essay, she ends up getting a 90 on it, which in her standards is a pretty low grade. So for the next rough draft, because she was going through so much stress and a lot of pressure for her original rough draft essay, she puts it off in fear that she'll get another so-called bad grade. And she ends up getting a 70 on her essay because she put the task off in fear of making mistakes. And that's basically an example of how perfectionism impacts Emily's life in terms of the college application process. And, um, you know, um, this is such a good example, Maddie. Um, before we move on, if you guys have any questions, feel free, feel free to put it in a chat box. And, and um, you know, when I see it, I can um, either post this question right now for our speaker to answer live or at the end, we'll have um, time for um, Q&A. Okay, so our next uh, example here is a boy named Ryan, and essentially he procrastinates a lot, right? So he's a senior in high school, and the thing is, he is a very smart kid. I mean, uh, in his elementary and middle school, he got good grades, and when he really wants to achieve something, he'll do it well. But uh, like many other teenage boys, he loves to play video games. I mean, like myself, I also do like playing video games. But Ryan really likes playing video games. And most importantly, he is motivated to attend a good college, but he is often procrastinating on his applications. 
So that is a problem that he has to fix. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what exactly is happening in Ryan's life? Like, how is procrastination really affecting his life? Essentially, Ryan has one early decision application that's due in a week. An early decision is basically um, when you apply to school, like usually the the due dates for schools are January 1st, but you can apply early to school and that's usually in like November or something. So Ryan has this early decision application that's due in a week and he tells his mother that he's fine and that he'll get to it and that he has enough time. And, and so instead of doing his work, he decides to binge uh, 10 episodes of the Netflix series Grey's Anatomy. And even when he finally does start doing his work, he ends up playing three hours of Super Mario instead. So it's not going well for Ryan in terms of his progress in his applications. And finally, the day before the due date, Ryan, he finally takes out his computer and now he's now it's time to cram in all his work. And he even does this with uh, some Grey's Anatomy in the background as background noise. Uh, I actually put this because my brother does that a lot. Like when he's procrastinating, he has this great, not Grey's Anatomy, but he has something in the background. And most importantly, because he started so late, his, his application is super messy and super unorganized and his essays maybe are not as well written as they could have been had he started earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Maddie and Ian. Amanda, all yours. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit now about what is happening here. So I'm sure that you are all here because you've seen either your children or your students um, or relatives get into <clears throat> one or um, both of these stories or similar stories. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about the cycles of procrastination and perfectionism. Slide. All right, so when we think about what happens, generally the first thing that happens is we're presented with a task. So we're either assigned homework or we have nothing to do. And so we know it's time to start either planning for the essay or writing the essay or filling out the application. And so as you can see, when the task is presented, our fear and anxiety starts to increase. And really what that's telling us is that this is a task we care about. This is something that's important to us. Otherwise, the fear or anxiety would not be present. And as it builds and builds, it's a very human reaction to then avoid. Because all of a sudden we're confronted with these really strong emotions, right? This fear and anxiety that wasn't there before. And it feels bad. So we decide to do something else. And that moment at the top there, when we decide to do something else, when we decide to avoid, we experience this moment of temporary relief. All of a sudden that fear and anxiety is alleviated and we no longer have it. And uh, there are plenty of things people do to avoid, and some are pretty clever. Uh, sometimes it's binge watching Netflix, and sometimes it's playing Mario Kart, uh, but other times it's reading and rereading a prompt. Sometimes it's doing homework. Sometimes it's cleaning the house. Um, sometimes it's just reassuring yourself, oh, I'm going to do it tomorrow because I'm a little too tired right now. These are all different types of avoidance because it, it doesn't really matter what the task is. It's not the task that you're afraid of doing. Uh, and so what ends up happening is we start to have these negative beliefs. Um, we think, oh, we actually can't do the task or it's too much for us um, because we now have kind of evidence that when we're presented with the task, we decide to do something else instead. And so it's this, it becomes this negative reinforcement cycle. So we are presented with the task, we avoid because we experience anxiety, and then the avoidance is reinforced because we feel better after we avoid. And what 
unfortunately, right, if, if this was just the cycle and it played out forever, potentially it would be um, something that we could overcome. But what happens when we avoid it is we make the fear and anxiety worse. So it actually increases the more frequently we avoid. So once we're presented with that prompt, with that start of the task, our fear and anxiety skyrockets. Uh, so I'm sure you've like very gently reminded, again, either your children or your students, um, oh, don't you have that college essay? And potentially they've snapped back in some way at you. Uh, and what you're experiencing there is that prompt, right? That reminder and then that expression of the fear and anxiety. Yeah. Sometimes having almost like having this argument with mom is almost, is all is also a, an avoidance behavior. Right. So I'm I'm open my computer. I'm about to do my college essay. I have all these thoughts about what if I don't get in? What if my essay is not good enough? And my mom is here giving me like a little gentle reminder. And then I pick a big fight with her. I have this huge reaction because now I'm going to have a fight with my mom. And I, ha I have the perfect excuse for not doing my essay because my mom is not being understanding enough for me to do it. And today is just not the right day because my mom is being annoying. <laughs> um. Exactly. <laughs> so here is just another uh, kind of example laid out of this cycle that we're talking about. So the homework that we're, or task we're presented with, right, the college essay, causes psychological stress, causes that fear or anxiety. So we get, engage in another non-homework related task, fighting with our parent, playing Mario Kart, um, doing a, a task adjacent uh, uh, repetitive thing, like, like reading and rereading a prompt. Um, something that we might convince ourselves is helpful, but isn't actually. And then we experience that temporary relief from feelings of anxiety and fear. And we're inadvertently learning, we're teaching ourselves that homework is harmful and that it needs to be avoided because our bodies have that physiological reaction to that fear and we're choosing flight, we're choosing to run away. And so we are, by evolution, designed to then respond similarly after when we're teaching our body that something is actually dangerous. And then our anxiety increases when we're presented with homework again. Just reinforcing that cycle. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we talk about um, when we think about like cognitive behavioral therapy. So there are three separate things to consider. So in the context of completing a college application, we a person might experience thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So examples of thoughts that students might have, my essay uh, has to be the best or I won't get in. What if I got into a much worse school than Amy or Julie? This is impossible to finish. I have way too much to do. So our thoughts impact our feelings and our behaviors. So the feelings we feel, right, again, are that fear and anxiety, anticipation. Um, and then the behaviors, how we respond in the presence of those thoughts and feelings, we might put it off to the next day, scroll through social media, um, spend too much time deciding on what essay topic is the most perfect topic to choose. Uh, so when we think about intervention, we have all of these different things to consider. And we want to try to separate them out because it makes uh, it just a little bit more clear where it's helpful to intervene uh, and where we might not really be able to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are various reasons for procrastination. <laughs> Um, so one can be pure boredom, um, negative beliefs like we were talking about before. I won't get in. Um, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. Perfectionism is definitely a reason people procrastinate. Uh, then we have anxiety and fear that comes along with it. 
and pure distraction. Uh, we all live in a world where we have regular access to pretty much anything we want. And we're constantly bombarded with little hits of dopamine through our phones and our emails, um, text messages, and other social media platforms, making it really hard to concentrate for long periods of time uh, because they're designed for that purpose especially. And so, you know, generally it's in combination with one of these other reasons, but distractions uh, are a really big part of the procrastination cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So now we're going to talk, right? So we've kind of explained what's happening here. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what doesn't work, where it's not super helpful to intervene. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm wondering if it's a helpful to do a little interaction here just to make sure people kind of understood the cycle, right? It is not that the kids does not want to complete the college application or they, just, they do not want to do the homework. They do want to do the homework. They want to do it too much, so much that it's causing them such distress that they cannot handle. So they're doing something else instead. What are some of the behaviors you guys see in your child or in yourself? Um, that when you, you know, maybe in yourself, you have some uh, thing at work that's really difficult. So you know, whenever you open up a computer or whenever you even think about doing that work, you are going to scrub the toilet or do something else or just like eat a bag of chips or, you know, whatever. What are some of the behaviors you, you see in yourself or in your children that they do to, um, you know, uh, cope with that distress uh, when they're about to do a task that, that caused them anxiety or fear? Can people put it in the chat? Um, or you can just like unmute and tell us any questions so far. Napping. Napping. Yeah. That's, a good one. <laughs> That's definitely a big one. I know for me, I like cleaning out my closet. Um, okay. So definitely seeing that anxiety and I see, yeah, he's telling you he's feeling anxious. Eating, yes, eating can definitely be a big coping mechanism and also a form of, of avoidance. Refilling coffee. Yeah, definitely the unimportant tasks. Yeah, that's why when you're having an important uh, assignment due, that's when your toilet gets clean over and over again. Like you never clean your toilet when you don't have any assignment due. You? <laughs> yeah, YouTube is definitely a, a big one and you can get lost in, in that for uh, indefinitely. Yeah, great. Great. Playing video games with friends. Yep, so definitely relating to Hui's house cleaning, <laughs> toilet cleaning. Right. Doing that for, yeah. Okay. Great. And then you realize that you're doing these things um, so that you will have a temporary relief from the distress you experience. And then after you've done this, now you still have to do that thing and you'll have less time to do it. So you're feeling like more anxious and, and until this all built up and, and this thing basically feels basically impossible for you to do anymore. Yeah, you're kind of building a, a wall for yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just as, as Hui said, procrastination is not the same as laziness. It can look similar, but the function is so different because the intention is not to relax and enjoy yourself. It's actually what's happening ends up being the opposite, right? We we feel stressed and, and anxious and and far from relaxed. Um, so the underlying assumption here that's, you know, been shown through research is that students want to succeed and finish. The opposite of, on the opposite side of anxiety is something that we care about, right? They, <laughs> they care about this a, a lot. Um, and the more pressure they feel, the more they avoid um, so the excuses, just like Wei was talking about, they're developed after the fact. 
it's to rationalize the avoidance. Oh, I got in a fight with mom. I can't possibly do my work now. That's not the reason that they're not doing the work, right? It's the excuse for not doing the work. They serve as that coping mechanism. So this is why nagging is just ineffective at changing behavior. If it worked, we would say, yeah, go for it. That's great. Um, so not that it's wrong. It's just not helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All righty. Um, okay. And then, I, you know, I think about... Um, and we're talking about nagging in a broader sense here, you know, sometimes maybe you don't say anything like, oh, I told you, you should have done this. But sometimes if you say things that you think you're trying to be helpful, right, you say things like, oh, do you think this is really important? You know, this physics exam is really important. I really want you to do well because I love you so much. Um, you know, but they do know that that physics exam is important. That's why it caused them anxiety and fear. If they don't care, you know, if they couldn't care less about the physics exam, they wouldn't be so anxious um, in that they want to kind of avoid the whole thing, right? Um, so, so what is happening here and how do we tackle this, right? And why nagging does not work, right? So think about this, right? So you, they open the computer, or sometimes they don't even open a computer. They just think about what they want to do. And just the thought of doing it is giving them so much anxiety, right? And if you at this point tell them, oh, you won't finish today if you won't, don't get it, start, get started right away, you know, remember to do it, right? What you're doing is that you are increasing this their stress. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, before I'm worrying about not writing a perfect essay. Now on top of that, I'm still worrying about my essay not doing not it not good enough. But on top of that, I'm worrying about my mom won't approve my essay, right? You're like increasing the stress or the the, the distress or anxiety. You're causing them more anxiety, and the, the more the more anxious they feel, the the the, dif the more difficult it is for them to deal with anxiety, right? And then think about the cycle, right? After they didn't do it, right? They failed. They end up and they, you know, end up playing video game all night. And they said that I'm gonna do it tomorrow, right? If now and so right now they have this negative belief that they might not be able to do it, that they are not made to do it, right? They this is a really difficult for them to finish. This is um, uh, something that that really hard for them, right? At this point, if we say something like, "Oh, I told you." That you should have done it sooner, right? Um, you didn't listen to me. Um, you you should do this, right? You are only reinforcing these negative beliefs about themselves, right? Which you are making them the next time, right? You're causing more negative beliefs. So the next time they face the same task, they have all these previous stress, right? About you know other people are gonna do it better, da 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 da. And then they have added stress about, oh, my mom is not gonna, if I don't do this, my mom is gonna criticize me again um, and such and such, or my parents are gonna have a fight about me not finishing it, right? So you're only kind of making it worse for them. Um, and the, the more pressure they feel, the more they are going to want to avoid that task because that the spike of fear and anxiety is only getting higher, right? And sometimes you are, I know you're trying to be really hopeful. And sometimes you can say it in a very, very gentle way, right? You can even say things like, hey, like, honey, what, what's up with the college application? Or you can say something like, oh, is there anything I can do to help you? But because they were so anxious and they're already are in such fear of being judged, right? They are like, they're very fragile at that moment, right? They know that they're not doing the right thing. They know that they are not doing it soon enough. They they wanted to do it soon enough. So they're very like vulnerable at this point. So even sometimes even a, a question or like a very, a reminder with very good intention could cause them to feel uh, very distressed. Um. And this and cause them to want to avoid it even more, right? So let's do a, a thought exercise, right? So let's say that you are a runner, right? 
and you want to start waking up in the morning, you want to wake up at 5.30 before mm -hmm. work, you're going to go out and run five miles and come back, right? And, and you, re you really want to do it. Nobody is forcing you to do it. You believe you should run. And you believe running is good for you. Um, you think this is important, right? And you are setting goals for yourself. You're like, I'm going to do this 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 number of miles at this pace at this distance right but then in the morning when you are you know 5 30 the alarm sounds you don't do it right so like how do you think what do you think would be helpful for you um to actually do get up and start running what do you think is not helpful for you right how do you overcome the pressure right so why don't we put it in the chat right? You, you want to run, right? You want to get up at 5.30 that's, or 6. That's not to be crazy, like 6, 6.30. And we're running for one mile, right? And then you truly believe this is good for you. And you truly want to do it, right? So what are some things that you can do, your partner can do, right? your, your wife or your husband or your mom can do to help you? And what are some things that they might do that they are trying to be helpful, but ends up really not helpful, right? Yeah, I like. Some, yeah, some things that are helpful is someone to run with, running in a group, so they can go together, registering for a race, so setting, yeah, a, a goal for yourself. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Even yeah. if it's late, just still go out. You know, you know, even even you run like go out, run like half a mile right? A quarter mile, still better than not running at all, right? But if I have this idea in my head that my run has to be perfect, it has to be five miles as this, as, at this exact pace, right? Once I miss that part, once I go, oh, it's like 6.15, there's no way I can do this today. Otherwise, I'm going to be late for work and I'm not going to do it at all, right? Right. So that's just thought experiment, right? So what if, you know, like I'm going to run, right? What if my husband tells me, Hui, do you know how good running will be for you? Like, do you understand the benefit of running? <laughs> how, do you, how do you think this is going to be helpful for me? Like my husband telling me the importance or the benefit of running. No, right, because I want to do it. <laughs> Like I care about it so much, um, right? Not at all, right? Right, I'll, I'll be annoyed, right? Um, right, and what if I go and I, you know, I, I just like, you know, I didn't do it for a day and then, or I did it, but not very well. And my husband, you know, you know, my husband come here and be like, wait, like that wasn't a very good man. Right. Like that, you know, you could have done better. If you have done better, you would have become a, a better runner and, and you would have have lower blood pressure or whatever, uh, all these benefits. Right. How does that help me or not help me? I like what Kathy says about giving self some reward when I get to run. Yep. Right. <laughs> he dares to say anything. I'm not going to run at all. Right. Exactly. That's how our children feel feel is that you know what I'm already like feeling like very bad about this and then if you say anything you know what just forget about it I can't I can't I'm not gonna do it anymore right not helpful but what is going to be helpful for me is that my husband say like hey it, you know let, let me do it with you why don't we um do it together um and he said something like you know what this was really hard for me too like when I was trying to run I was also you know but you know you know even if you got up you know if you're late just just go take a walk like a, take a short walk and come back that's fine right and tomorrow we're, we're gonna try again right you know where he he breaks it down right tomorrow we're gonna just take a walk for we're gonna take a walk for like 10 days and then we're gonna slowly increase that right what are some what else can you can you guys think of that are also going to be helpful if I want to run. I like someone says giving myself some reward. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the reward after the fact. I also think uh, 
you know, it doesn't have to be the same exact task, but if Wei's husband gets at the same time as her and does something that he really wants to do or accomplishes a goal he wants to achieve, then they're still like doing it together, right? Because you're not going to be filling out your college applications, um, but you could be working towards a goal at the same time. Right, right. And if he wants to be even more empathetic, he could say something like, oh, it was hard for me to do this thing till, you know, let's do it together. We're all, you know, we're all going through this. Um, so let's talk about what does work, right? What can we do, right? So this is where we act, right? Do not, so we were talking about do not act before the task and do not say anything after the fact that they didn't do it. You're like, oh, Right. This is where when you see that they kind of they are opening their computer, they're starting to get these anxious, you know, thoughts about it. And this is where you act, right? And you're we're going to do something that to help to manage the fear and anxiety, right? So the amazing thing about this is that when you actually experiencing so much anxiety, right? Fear and goes up this, right? But if you stick to it, right? If you're like, no, I'm not going to uh, watch um, TV. I'm not going to play Mario's, right? I'm not going to scrub my toilet. I'm sticking with it. And this gets really bad, but guess what? Um, this calms down, right? You don't, you don't like, you don't die from it, right? You, you don't be like, oh, right. Like this is, you actually, like this starts to kind of become easier and easier to manage, right? But guess what? And then maybe I end up doing my work. Maybe I did some running, right? So maybe here is that this child actually finished their work, right? What happens when they finish their work? It kind of tackled the, the negative beliefs. Now they have confidence. Now they have some success stories. Now they can tell themselves, oh, it was really hard, but I did it. It turns out I could do some writing. It turns out I could do some math, right? So the next time they face the same math or same essay or same task or, you know, they're not going to have as much of fear or anxiety, right? And then that's easier for them to manage. And if they do this multiple times, they are going to um, change this behavior to believe that, you know what, I can do this, right? Um, and so this fear and anxiety gets lower and lower and this negative belief become a positive belief about, um, they feel empowered, like actually I can do this. Mm -hmm. So right. there's a question in the chat way. Do you want me to read it to you? Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, I see. Do you recommend to finish application draft in the summer, right? It depends, right? So I really like this question because over here, right? The closer you are to the deadline, the more anxiety and fear you have when you do the task, right? So when you have time to finish, you are not going to experience that much anxiety and fear, right? Um, you're like, oh, I still have time, so I'm going to do it a little bit, little, right? But if the task is due tomorrow, right, you're going to have a lot of anxiety and fear, and then this feels impossible. So I, I think it does make sense to do the draft um, as early as possible. But just telling them, hey, I think you should do your draft in the summer is not going to be very helpful, Right. Um, we have to break it down for them, right? But, you know, I do agree. And the earlier they do it, um, they have the easier time they will have. Um, let me clear this and let me go to the next slide. Which I'm trying to. Right. So what we're going to do is that we're going to kind of balance this, right? We're going to think about what the power it takes or the dopamine it takes to overcome this and, and think about the resistance, right? So think about a, a task like watching TV, right? Watching or playing Mario's, right? Um, how, um, you know, how much, uh, how much dopamine, how much pleasure does it give me? A lot of pleasure, 
right? How much resistance does it have? Very low resistance. It doesn't really take much for me to play Mario or watch TV. I'm just sitting there watching TV. So this is an easy task, right? This pleasure is bigger than a resistance, right? But think about if I'm doing chemistry and let's say like I'm so scared of chemistry, right? What ple how much pleasure do I get from doing chemistry? Very little, because I don't really enjoy doing it. I don't think I'm very good at it, right? I don't get really get a sense of accomplishment when I do chemistry. And, and maybe I don't have, you know, I don't have that internal sense of accomplishment when I do chemistry. Every time I do chemistry, maybe I feel so bad. Maybe I feel like, oh my God, I'm so dumb, right? Um, and I don't get that, you know, kind of sense of accomplishment, right? Um, and I, maybe I don't get a lot of external sense of achievement too, right? But how much resistance do I have? I have a lot of resistance, right? So when this bar is lower than this bar, we're not going to be able to do it. So what we're going to do is to even out the two bar, right? We're both going to increase the sense of either internal uh, sense of accomplishment or external reward, right? And we're going to lower the resistance how do we do that, right? Um, okay, to increase, to, to work on this side, right? So some of the things that we can do is that maybe I don't have a lot of sense of accomplishment when I do my college essay because I'm just not very good at writing, right? But if I add some external reward, right? Every time I write one sentence, um, I give myself a point, and every time I collect five points, I get to watch my favorite TV show, or I guess to go get, you know, depends on what you like, right? I get to have a sleepover with my best friends, right? So that kind of, that's like increasing this bar, right? What's so good about this is that when I become, you know, when I like do more and more of this writing that I'm not very good at, like when I do more and more, I get actually more sense of internal sense of accomplishment too. And maybe I'd be like, wait a minute, maybe I am I am able to do some writing, right? And maybe writing is actually kind of enjoyable, right? So you get an increase. So you're gonna start with rewarding yourself externally just to get yourself started. And by just by doing it over and over again, you're gonna get better and better at it. And when you get better and better at it, maybe someday you don't need that external reward anymore because this task has become intrinsically um, um, you know, enjoyable for you, right? You actually like to do it, right? And on the other hand, we're gonna decrease that resistance. How do we do this? We're going to break down the task into very, very teeny tiny steps so that the 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 it what it takes very little effort to actually do it right so if we're writing a five page essay the first step is going to be i'm going to open a word document and you know save that document as the title of my essay that is the first step when i'm done with this step i'm going to give myself a point right so you're decreasing the resistance right it's not so hard to open a word document everybody could open the word document and save it right and the next step is to write the first word. Everybody can write one word, right? Just put that down, whatever that word is, put it down on paper. And then I com I completed that, right? Like I give self myself some reward, right? So decrease this and increase this. Um, and I, 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 one thing I really like to say in our prep program um, uh, coaching in our training is that if a task does not get done, the steps are not small enough. Right, uh, and we need to break it even into very, very small uh, and manageable pieces so the students do not feel overwhelmed. So I wanna go back to this question about, do you recommend to finish application draft in the summer? Right, yes, right? The earlier you finish a draft, the more time you have to revise it, to, to think about it, right? But the question is that how do we get a student to do a draft in the summer, right? Just telling you, hey, you should do it in the summer or hey, you should do it earlier. It's not going to be helpful, right? But what is going to be helpful is to help them break these tasks, right? Like maybe think about how many essays do you need to write, 
right? Maybe one main essay, two supplemental essays, right? For this main essay, how many steps are there, right? Step one, open a document. Think about where you're going to put it. Step two, right? What Think about like brainstorming. What is going to be your first paragraph? What is going to be your second paragraph? What is going to be the first sentence of your first paragraph, right? If someone can sit down with you, kind of really break it down for them, and they can do it step by step, that is going to be much easier than saying, hey, finish your draft or finish your thing. So, so when you ask a question, right, do not ask, oh, have you done your essay? Ask, like, you know, help them break it down into smaller steps. Um, and then, so this is what kind of, you know, we recommend, and this is also how we help our students complete either their college essay or their assignment, you know, um, you know, in our work, we have coaches who coach students to all kinds of, uh, work, their homework, et cetera, et cetera. And then kind of all follows the, the same principle, um, is that first break the task into smaller chunks, like I said an increased external reward. After I write one sentence, I give myself something. And after I collect how much I, I get to do what I wanna do, right? And, and limit distractions. And I wanna talk a little bit more about limit distractions, um, right? Kids are so, um, they are faced with so many distractions nowadays and we have, I think we have to approach it carefully, right? If you say like, Johnny, like I'm, I'm going to take your phone away. I'm going to take your computer away. I'm going to cut your internet because you are, because that's distracting for you. And Johnny might become very resistant, be like, my mom is the worst, right? You don't understand, right? But if we talk to them like, hey, Johnny, um, so there is something we call motivational interviewing, which is something that we also train our executive functioning coach to use. Be like, hey, Johnny, like I know you're trying to uh, complete your thing. And I kind of noticed that every time, you know, you know, you do that, you kind of spend a lot of time on your phone. Like, how does that help you or not help you? And you can even share some of your personal stories Like you know, like I, when I was in school or, you know, actually earlier today, when I was at work, I was trying to complete this um, statistics analysis assignment or whatever, and it was really hard for me. So I ended up being on social media for like an hour. And actually at that point, I wish someone say like, hey, like you actually need to do this, right? I wish someone would be able to hold me accountable for that, right? Do you want someone to kind of do that to me? Because I know you care about this chemistry or I know you care, you care about this college essay, right? We have to do it very careful. Um, and, and then just kind of get started, right? We don't talk about this, right? That's why I kind of, you know, um, we're talking about how, you know, executive functioning coaching. And one of the things that why our program works is that you know, we don't really talk, you know, we teach you strategies. We teach you how to use a planner. We teach you how to do a, uh, use a calendar, set an alarm, except we do teach you these things. But one hallmark of things we do is that let's do it right now. Just open it right now. Let's get it done. Let's get it started. Instead of like, we can talk a lot about it, but if by the end of the, end of the day, you don't do it, it's really like not helpful, right? So let's do it right here, right now. Just open your computer right now. Let's, we're gonna do it together with you. Um, Amanda, do you wanna talk about the 70, 20, 10 rule? Yeah, I, before I uh, do that, I just wanna emphasize the external rewards. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes that has a specific connotation. Like you hear the word reward and you think of, you know, like an M&M or an ice cream cone or money or something like that. But it can, it can be like, okay, I'm gonna write one sentence and then I'm gonna let myself clean my toilet. Right. It can be the thing that you're going to do to avoid. Um, but you just want to make sure you have a really small goal that's related directly to the task you're about to do. And you want to do that first um, because then we're breaking that cycle. Uh, so the re reward really can it doesn't have to be something tangible. Um, but when we think of the uh, 70, 20, 10 uh, rule, volume um, 
is the emphasis there. So the idea is we uh, only 10% of the things that we produce are going to be great or perfect. So in order to get that 10%, we have to do 70% of things that are really just done, right? Not so good. Um, and then 20% that is good or acceptable, passable in order to get that 10% of perfection. So we really got to increase the volume. Um, and this is helpful for people who uh, tend towards perfectionism uh, because we, you know, if they're kind of following this rule with their tasks, then they can feel like, okay, I know that 10% can be perfect because I've done this other stuff that um, fits into that 70 or 20% category. That's not so great. So we're kind of targeting those cognitions there a little bit too with the perfectionism. Right. Speaking of external reward, um, Amanda, you reminded me. I want to ask people this question because I know uh, your organization, PCE, talks a lot about parenting. You guys are um, learned a whole lot about you know parenting. There is one theory um, that says you should never externally reward a child for something that they would intrinsically want to do, right? Do you guys hear that theory? There was a lot of talk about um, you know, do not reward yourself externally. Let them have intrinsic motivation to do their work. Do you guys hear that a lot? Or do you believe that? I want to, you know, kind of explain how that works. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around this, right? Um, in the chat, maybe put down like, you know, what you believe you do. Yes, heard of it, right? The, the theory is that you should never reward a child for reading. Otherwise, they're going to just read to get that reward, get that TV time or whatever reward you're pro providing, right? Right. So I want to be very clear that what the research says, right? The research says do not externally reward people for things that they already enjoy doing, right? The research never says never externally reward anyone or never reward people for doing something that they don't know how to do yet, right? That's not what it says, right? Let me kind of make it, break it down really. I, I'm hoping, how can I break it down? Hold on, hold on. I'm getting a whiteboard, okay. <laughs> okay, let's just say that writing is your favorite activity. You just cannot wait to write, right? Um, you like writing, you write journals, et cetera, right? So every time you write, something you get this amount of pleasure like this is this is the amount of pleasure you get when like this is the intrinsic um amount of pleasure you get right like without any reward when you do writing you feel this this good this amount of pleasure to do it right and then every time you write you remember oh writing was wait where did that go <laughs> this um, wait hold on okay this amount of okay you feel this good, right? And then the next day you write, you also kind of feel feel this good, right? You feel this good. And then the third day you write, you feel this good, right? You're feeling this good, good. And then someone come to you and be like, Hui, I love your writing. Every time you write, I'm going to give you some ice cream, right? So I'm like, oh, I got, I got this amount of pleasure for actually doing the actual writing. And then on top of that, I got, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna do some like, trying to do something here. I get this amount, right? And then, but I also got this amount of reward for um, the ice cream. So I remember writing was this much fun. It was this amount, the red amount of intrinsic joy and the blue represent like the external reward I got, right? So what I remember is that writing was this fun, right? The next time I do writing, I'm expecting how much fun? I'm expecting this amount of fun, right? But next time there was nobody here to say, wait, here's ice cream for your writing, right? So I experienced this much fun, 
as usual, but like, hey, writing kind of feels disappointing. It was, I'm disappointed because I remember it being that much fun, but now I'm kind of experiencing this much fun, right? It's kind of, this is the theory, right? This is the research about why you should not never reward yourself or a child for something that they already enjoy. But that's not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about this, how much joy does this child get for writing? Zero right now, zero. Right. So they ends up not doing it where they hate doing it. Right. So what you are trying to do is that you're trying to say, if you do your writing, I'm going to, you know, you get to watch some TV. So you're trying to create some motivation, right, for them to feel good. The next time like, they are going to do writing, they're like, oh, I remember writing was at least this much fun. Right. And then actually you are gonna you want to do this over and over again. So that this child actually start enjoy writing, right? So the, maybe in the future when they write, they're like, oh, you know what? Looks like I can do this. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like that terrible, right? So maybe they also get some kind of, um, you know, in, intrinsic, um, you know, in, in, internal um, joy from it, right? And then you can kind of decrease the, the, the external motivation. I hope that makes sense. I, I'm, I was just doing this whole <laughs> On the on the fly, but I really hope that that I clarified that that it, the research never ever said that you should not reward yourself. Uh, that's not what it says. It said what it, it, it's such a, a misunderstanding of the research. Okay, I went on a tangent. Now I'm back. <laughs> okay, um, okay, so that's like kind of how we tackle this, right? Um, so we're going to now have Maddie and Ian share how what we're going to do to help the student uh, we shared in the beginning. Um, okay, so basically a simplified version of what um, Dr. Huay and Dr. Amanda were saying before um, was uh, create a schedule to map out what you have to do. It's really easy to kind of get lost in the idea of setting goals for yourself. So creating a rough outline of your work ahead of time and breaking tasks down into smaller, simpler, more achievable steps, like they were saying before, can really positively impact your work ethic. And it can also make the task seem a little bit less daunting. And also, it's really important to limit time to certain tasks. Don't spend, you know, 15 hours or an all nighter just working on one portion of your essay, in Emily's case. Um, break it up into I'll spend 10 minutes working on this part, 10 minutes working on this part. And in total, I'll work an hour each day on this. By breaking it up into that certain time limit, it'll make it a little bit less daunting and more achievable. It's also really important to look at a, tax, a task in context. So really important to keep your perspective on your outlook on the situation very positive. And to do that, you can also increase motivation. So watch a short episode of your favorite show or something like that. In Emily's case, let's say her favorite show is a baking show on Netflix. If she watches her baking show on Netflix for a couple days, um, a couple, sorry, a couple hours or a couple minutes before or after she writes her essay, then it can motivate her to um, continue her task. And also, if she notices that she's spending too much time watching Netflix, then she can ask her mom or her friend to control the Netflix password and only let her sign in and use Netflix after, after she completes each task. So that's really helpful as well. And just to continue on that, um, more like emotional thing is to really be aware of self-acceptance. So in Emily's case, reminding herself that struggle is not a reflection of self-worth can really lead to a sense of connection and belonging. Because at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a perfect essay or a perfect college application because humans are intrinsically flawed and we make certain decisions. So it's really important to understand that struggle is really not the definition of who you are, it's just showing your resilience and showing your 
perseverance during this process. And to follow up on that, changing your perspective is really important as well. So viewing situations as a glass half full instead of a glass half empty could be really good. Um, instead of seeing things as character flaws, use them as opportunities to learn more about yourself. Because ultimately, the fear of failure is the fear of success. And last but not least is to see the bigger picture. Again, it's just about your perspective. And try to focus on the meaning of the activity. If something brings you joy and purpose, if something intrinsically makes you happy, then it doesn't matter if it's done perfectly or done in a certain way, because if it intrinsically makes you happy, you'll be more motivated to do it. So again, learning to embrace mistakes by viewing them as learning opportunities is really important, especially in the college application process where it's very challenging and very difficult. It's really important to view it as a step-by-step -step process rather than an all or nothing situation. Great, great, thanks Maddie. Before, um, Ian, before you start, there's a question in the chat. So when we think about the most effective reward system, it really is individualized because the whole point of positive reinforcement is that the thing you're rewarding yourself with increases the behavior you want to see. So in this case, if college applications, doing your college application is the behavior you want to see, then it has to be something desired for that person. So you really need to work with the person you're trying to motivate to um, come up with something that is a good reward. So like it would be very different what would help Hue get out of bed um, to run in the morning from what would help me to get out of bed to run in the morning. And probably if Hue's husband was like trying to encourage me to get out of bed in the morning, it wouldn't really matter too much to me. Um, so you really do have to think about what um, the person you're trying to motivate wants. Yeah, essentially, this is a conversation um, you should have with your child, right? This is like one of the conversation our coach have with our clients all the time, be like, you know, what motivates you? Um, so there is really isn't some people like, like us, like a list of potential rewards we give, right? You know, we could give a list, but that's not going to be helpful, right? You have to th think about what motivates um, your child, you know, you, you know them, right? Or you ask them, have a conversation with them. Um, um, and then I think the, the question is about how the reward bar keeps being elevated. Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand, but I take it being, so maybe say like, you know, right now, you know, maybe I reward this child for completing like one page of math. And then maybe like they continue to require that or that they, you, they, they require, you know, that you have to, you know, now they, they want, uh, you know, 10 minutes of video game for finishing one one page of math, but now they're asking for 20 minutes of video game time for um, doing the same amount of math. Yeah, so you, tr you want to try to work in the opposite direction. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for something like a college application, that's time limited. So it, it, I guess the, the moment I read your question, I thought of... Um, like my salary, I get an increase in pay regularly, right? Because that's how salaries work. So the reward bar there does keep getting higher. Um, but especially with a time limited task like college applications, potentially it's okay to increase the motivation right. um, if the task is getting a little bit harder or the deadline is approaching faster. Um, but for things that are more consistent, like homework generally, uh, we want to think about instead of 10 minutes on your video games for one page of math or something, it, in, instead it's two pages of math for 10 minutes um, of video games. Uh, so you want to try to work in that direction for uh, longer tasks. Because right, the idea, right. like as Hue was demonstrating, is that you're building that confidence and motivation and that intrinsic motivation um, as you're using the external reward. So we're shrinking the external reward over the long term as that motivation is increasing. And one thing I want to add is that don't forget to break the task down. 
right, into small steps and reward them. When you give them a reward, you want them to get it, right? Like you want them to be successful, right? So one uh, common mistake I see from many parents be like, oh, I'm going to reward you with this big vacation once you complete the entire application. But they cannot, right? They are not, right? Like they need someone to break it down for them, right? And, and one mom told me, like I told my daughter, if she completes assignment by 9 p.m. every day, she's going to get her phone, right? But she didn't break it down. So she, she told me every day at 8 55 her daughter like becomes fanatic be like ah I need to do my homework right now and she doesn't get it done and she never gets the reward right so what could have happened with this mom is that the daughter gets home at five and she break it down the the she checks the homework see what's due and she said let's do you know maybe you have two page of math you have two you know two paragraphs of this, and then we do it make it into like 10 small pieces and every time you've done one of these pieces um, you come here and I give you a point or something or a check or a check mark or something right so like the, so you're checking in with her every 10 minutes instead of giving her three full hours to uh, to spend and at the end she's going to fail right and so with that whole vacation story, if you complete your college application, I'm going to reward you with a vacation, right? Break it down, right? When you finish the first paragraph of your first essay, I'm going to give you a check mark. And when you finish the second paragraph, I'm going to give you this. And when you kind of accumulate this, I may be like, 20 check marks leads to a vacation of some short, right? Of some sort, right? So really breaking it down for them is the key. Yeah, sorry. I'm sure you can tell that way and I could probably talk about this forever and <laughs> I want to be mindful of time. Um, but one, uh, just to, I guess, like piggyback off of that, a lot of people feel like we shouldn't reward things that should be done right? My kids just should do this, right? They're old enough. If they can't do it now, they're never going to learn. But if they could do it, they would. And so we want to also think about rewards again as like a, a catalyst right, to bring um, them to the point where they can do it on their own. Um, so the assumption is they could if they would, or they would if they could. Right. Yeah, just remember, your kids also care so much about college application. They want to do it. They want to get it done. They're just like unable to do it and they need some help, right? Okay. Um, Ian, you're up. Okay. Um, so yeah, battling procrastination, right? So for Ryan, uh, the first thing you can do is reset your work environment. So like when we were looking at Ryan, uh, we know that his work environment wasn't really, really the best, right? Even when he was uh, starting his applications and stuff, he still had Grey's Anatomy in the background or whatever. And he still had Super Mario there. Maybe his Super Mario was just like a couple of feet away from him. The point is that they are distractions. And uh, Ryan, being a smart kid, he knows that that those things are distractions. He knows that Grey's Anatomy and Super Mario is distractions. And he really does want to complete his application but he simply lacked the discipline to do so. So instead, you can have him work in a space without these distractions, uh, such as sitting next to his mother, who may be working alongside him, and it's, it's kind of like checking up on him. Um, you can also set some clear goals, like writing to-do lists and breaking tasks down into smaller steps, so that just so that you're more motivated to complete them and you're not as overwhelmed, because obviously... Um, tackling this one huge goal may seem too far of a stretch and you can set deadlines for these steps um, and finally I mean we just talked a lot about the importance of rewards but once Ryan does these tasks you could reward him with uh, TV with Grey's Anatomy or Super Mario and that just so that he has more of this incentive to complete his applications so yep And the last one here is time management techniques. So there's this very famous one called the Pomodoro technique, Pomodoro method. And it's just it's just like long periods of work and then there's a quick short break and then another long period of work. And it's just a cycle like that. Um, 
that kind of just gives you that routine so that you can continue pushing through while working. And having a timer can also be great because um, it help you keep yourself accountable. Uh, and you know that you have that time duration where you're not supposed to be looking at anything else but your work. So, yeah, so these kind of things can really help with dealing with procrastination. Great. That is our presentation.